Hey guys, now I want to talk a little bit about the taskbar notification area as well as jump list and arrow peaks. So I just want to talk a little bit about this. We also call the notification area down here at the bottom. We call that the sys tray or sometimes even the system tray. And in this demonstration I'm using a Windows 8.1 machine. Uh, you see that the start button here is different and so we're not going to really go into that but if you get a chance to work with a Windows 8 machine or 8.1 machine you can see the difference in that. Now here in the system area, system tray, notification area uh, there's information about open programs and quick access to others. Now you can, let's say there's a program you got that you frequently use that you want to always be down here in your system tray you can right click on that area and attach it here. And the way you do that is you right click on the program you know if you have brought up your start menu and you can right click on a program and pin to taskbar. And you can do that in Windows Explorer as well. I just want to make sure you guys knew about that. Also here in the notification area uh, you can see that the right side displays different open services and you almost always see like the volume and wireless here you also see the time and date I mentioned a term here called service now service is just a program that runs in the background and these are just they support or serve windows or possibly your applications as well and we'll take a look at services uh, later on in further chapters in more detail now if we wanted to uh, see what all is open in down here in our, in our taskbar we can just hover over an item and you'll see that a small window pops up above them to show us what is actually underneath there so if we clicked on that application or that shortcut there that's what would pop up and the process for this is called mouse over now if I had several different windows open or tabs open here in my Google Chrome browser then as I hover or mouse over the Google Chrome icon I would see a depiction of each window listed above there and the reason this is possible is because of what I mentioned earlier in our arrow interface alright now let's take a at the jump list if you right click on one of your system tray icons here you will see many different options. This is what's called the jump list. So it kind of provides some of the major functions of a program. Now if we go ahead and take a look at arrow peak, you see if we go to the rectangle at the end of our system tray here, and we click on that, everything minimizes unless we had some of our gadgets possibly on our desktop uh, we would all see those but any open applications minimize that we had currently open our desktop we click it again and they start opening back up now earlier I mentioned doing a little bit of customization I'm going to show you how to do that now uh, we can right click down here in our taskbar and we can click properties now as you see here we can use this to kind of you know customize what appears in our start menu and our taskbar and we can just you know change different things we can auto hide the taskbar so that when we're not hovering over it with our mouse it is hidden so we have more of a viewing area for our active desktop or whatever application we're running we can lock it in place we can change the size of our taskbar icons lots of things you can do here you can also as I mentioned earlier work on our start menu or we can work with our notification area here you can see what we can show or hide different icons that are going to be in our notification area here if we want to customize our start menu we can click on the tab here and we can tell what the power button is going to do we can customize what links we want to see and not see so as I said earlier if we wanted to hide some of this here 
we could do that in our customized start menu area here. Okay, now let's say we want to personalize our Windows desktop here. So it's really simple. We can just right click anywhere here on the desktop. We can choose personalize. And then we have a plethora of options available to us here. Quick example, let's say we just don't like the standard Windows desktop background. We want to select something different. We can click on that. Let's say we like, you know, we can scroll through here or we can browse our computer for pictures that we've saved. Just for a quick example, let's just say we want to select this. We click that. Now you can see that is going to be our standard desktop background for whenever we log into our machine. Of course, if we don't like it, we can cancel. We can change the the way that it's if we want to do tiles, we can make everything into a tile view. We can center it whatever the case may be. As you uh, try to personalize with your own images, you may see that you need to configure the picture position to get the best view. Now we can also change different sounds. We can change if we have a screensaver or not. You can see that with the symbol here, I'm not using a screensaver, but you could change that if you needed. Lots of options here to mess around with and play around with on your own. From a troubleshooting perspective, sometimes uh, people will mess with their backgrounds. You know, let's say they accidentally delete an image or they move an image and it's no longer located on their computer, and then they realize they don't have that as their background, and they put in a help ticket or a call and say, "Hey, you know, this my background doesn't look the same, or my pictures are lost." That's one of the areas that uh, the personalization of the background can become an instant issue. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, one of the most common problems we find is with the display. Um, people you know, sometimes will hook up a new monitor or they will accidentally change the screen resolution which uh, screen resolution is just a number of dots or pixels on the monitor screen as expressed with two numbers. And an example, I'll show you this, we can just right click here on the desktop anywhere, we can select screen resolution, and you can see that I currently am using a virtual box that is using a screen resolution of 1440 by 795. Now I can change that to 1024 by 768, I'll hit apply, you can see the change that affects, you can see how the display was greatly affected. If I don't like that display, I can revert, and now I'm back to seeing everything full screen. If I wanted to go to a very low resolution, hit apply, and you see how everything just comes together real small in my viewing area. So I definitely don't like that. I'm going to hit revert. We'll take that back up to the max, and hit OK. Now everything looks back to normal. So you'll find out that sometimes you need to go in here and mess with the screen resolution to be able to have the best viewing experience possible. Now, not all people like to use the maximum resolution because as you get uh, screen resolution with a greater, uh, let's just say the greater pixelation or number of dots, um, it gets very crisp, but things seem to be very small to tighten everything in. Um, and some people may not like that. They want to see everything in a larger view. So you'll need to lower their resolution to what best fits them. Now if you're very experienced with Windows, you'll know that when it comes to doing things in Windows, there's all kinds of ways to do it. With the An example with the screen resolution, let's say I just want to go another way of doing that rather than on screen resolution, I could click on personalize. And when that window opens up, you see here that we have display. I could click on display there. And lo and behold, there's adjust resolution. I click that exact same window. You're going to find which way that you want to go through different features of Windows based on your own personal preference. Now, two of the most useful tools with the Windows operating system is the Windows Explorer and the computer window. Um, and your preference as to which one you prefer. But let's Let's just take a look at this real quick. To open the computer window, uh, as I'm showing you a Windows 7 machine this time, we'll just go down to the Start button here. And we're going to make it real trivial. We're just going to select Computer. 
And when I click that, you can see that I have access to different drives. Uh, my libraries, such as documents, music, pictures, etc., are all here. It, kind of the same thing. We could just go down here for opening Windows Explorer. Let's see, we'll go ahead and close this first. Look at that. This file explorer or Windows Explorer icon is right here. Look familiar? Alright, so there's different ways. Another way, um, and it's all on your personal preference. If for some reason this isn't located here in the taskbar, you could simply right click on the start button, open Windows Explorer, lo and behold, you guessed it, yet another way to open the same thing in Windows. Now every operating system manages a hard drive, an optical drive, USB drive, or other types of drives by using directories. We also call this folders. Way back in the Windows 3.1 days, that's where we got the term folders and subdirectories and files, tree structure. Um, so a lot of these terms are still used today, um, but it just depends on your preference as to how you want to reference something. But uh, as Windows moves from one operating system to the next latest and greatest, a lot of these terms and features just carry on into the new one. Now a drive is organized with a single root directory. And if I click on computer here, you can see, we'll just take a look at the root directory of C. This is the uh, my hard drive. This is where my operating system is, all my files and everything like that. Now if we click on this, we have a what's called a top-down hierarchical structure of subdirectories. Um, now the hard drive is in partitions, but let's say we just click on program files. Click on program files, we have folders. We've gone down to a, another directory or another subdirectory and then we can just click on let's say Microsoft Office there's Office click on that folder we just keep going layer after layer after layer or directory subdirectory subdirectory so hopefully you get the gist of that now as we move into further chapters you'll see how we can take a hard drive and then divide that into partitions where each volume has its own root directory and hierarchical structure of subdirectories. And we'll do that later on in chapters, you know, where I can take essentially taking a book and then creating other books from that by t tearing off pages and having those set aside. So you'll get the idea of it later on. Now, as I mentioned before, with files and directories, the root directory can hold those files of other directories. And these directories, as I mentioned earlier, are called subdirectories. Sometimes we refer to them as child directories, or even simpler, just because of the uh, icons, we just call them folders. And that within those folders, you can have more folders or more subdirectories. So hopefully, you uh, have a good sense of what that is. Here's a graphic here for we have a single hard drive picture here in the middle and we've partitioned that single hard drive into two different partitions or two different halves if you want to say that where we have each one is essentially the same thing we have a root and then we have subdirectories and then subdirectories and subdirectories or folders within folders it's just kind of you know however you want to set them up um, it's based on your personal preference on a standard you know desktop or laptop generally you're going to see that there may be two partitions on the hard drive one being a kind of system recovery partition in case something happens and go back to the initial state or uh, you may even see um, and then you have your main uh, partition for your operating system and all your files some people may take and partition their hard drives to where they have like a storage partition where all of their files are located and then they have another partition that just has their operating system to kind of keep those separated. Now let's take a look at file names or path names. And you can see here the path is, you'll see this term used a lot, the location file referenced by a drive as we see here the drive is the C colon, this is the root directory of the path to a folder. And we break this up into whatever subdirectories the file name and the file extension, so the type of file that that file is. So if you take a look at this one here, we have a root directory of C colon, and you see we have a backslash when we're doing a file path name. We always use a backslash. If you're using a URL in a web browser, 
we use forward slash, but when we talk about file path names, we use a backslash. So we have the first subdirectory of our main root directory is called data. So there's a folder called data here on our C drive. And if you go to the next level down, there's another folder once you click inside data that's called business. Once you get into the business folder, you'll see there's a file called letter. And the file extension may or may not be seen, but if the file extension is seen or we're trying to get to that file, we use the file extension .docx. This represents a Word document. So if it was, let's say, in Excel, we might have XLSX or .xls. It's the file extension tells us what type of file this is in our path in our directory. I'll show you a quick example here. Let's just say we're going to go to a file. We'll just start clicking. We'll take a look at a font. Of course, I choose one of the largest folders possible. So I'm going to switch. We're just going to choose a music file. So we're just going to go to click on our music library here. We'll go ahead and click on that. Now we're going to, we'll just select one of these here. If I click up here in the address bar, you'll see that just like that path description was on the previous slide, we have our root directory, we have our subfolder, subfolder, subdirectory, child directory, and we're using the backslash. Now we don't see the file extension here, but we could change that view. Well, we're in details now, but we could change this to actually show our file extensions. Click on view here. You see right now, we currently have these hidden. But if we wanted to show them, we could show hidden files and folders. If we wanted to you know, not hide our extensions, we could uncheck that. So we could check those if we really wanted, but we're not going to for this lesson. But in another lesson, we will see the different types of file extensions that you may come across generally.